Guys, it's Cajun time and Christmas a little mixed up here. Welcome to the St. Canard Files, a Darkwing Duck podcast. I'm your host, Will Santana, and... I'm Mike Russo, and I'm developing a grudging respect for Jambalaya Jake. <laughs> All right, Mike, man, it's uh, Christmas time, and we could talk a little Bayou Cajun here today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Christmas is just a couple of days away, so I'm excited. Okay, but before we get into Christmas a little bit, I just want to mention I love Cajun food. Uh, I love gumbo. Uh, I love crawfish. Uh, I get a little timid by, you know, tearing the crawfish open and stuff because to me it looks like a roach. It's like the roach of the sea or something or a roach of the swamp. (laughs) But I do love the taste of it. Um, I love spicy food. I love dirty rice. Some people call it Cajun rice, but uh, I I love Cajun food, man. I love my spices and stuff, man. Cool. I'm... I don't really think I've ever had Cajun food. What? You know, maybe I've, I've had it once or twice, but it's not something I eat very frequently. Hmm. You know what? I could see that from when I was up north. I don't remember eating Cajun food at all until I moved to the south. So I, I could see that. I definitely could see that. I got my Cajun seasoning and everything, Creole seasoning. Oh, man, I love that stuff, dude. Yeah, it's definitely something that's more southern for sure. Okay, that's, yeah. That's, that's something that people up where I'm from really eat. <laughs> I think you have to go out of your way to get that around here. Okay. All right. But it's also Christmas time, Mike. And you wanted to talk some Christmas. We got to talk Christmas. This is a family show. So, of course. You know, yeah, man. By all means, you know, what do you and your family normally do for Christmas? Um, so, Christmas, you know, our big day is Christmas Eve. Mm-hmm. Like, we it actually even back up. I'll back up a little bit. Um, My wife's family on her mother's side are Polish. Mm -hmm. So every year we make pierogies. Oh, okay. Um, You know what pierogies are, right? Oh, yeah. They're pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, they're really good, especially when they're homemade. So we go over there. We have a whole pierogi party where um, we make them with sauerkraut, cheese, and potato. And the whole family will spend, like, hours making Mm -hmm. these things. And they're so good. (laughs) And I know one year we made about a 1,000 of them. Mm-hmm. And that's like our that's like the big Christmas tradition in my wife's family. Then on Christmas Eve, that's the big day for all of us. We all get together at my uh, my in laws' house as many fa- as much of my wife's family as it can actually fit into the house. Um, it's fun, and we got um we have more kids in the family this year. Um, my daughter has a new a couple of new cousins, and uh, yeah, Christmas Eve is the big holiday. You know, that's really the big day. Christmas Day is more about just, you know, sitting around, watching movies in our pajamas and relaxing. But Christmas Day is big. We'll be up past midnight. Not as much as these days because, you know, we have to get you know, our daughter home for Santa Claus, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, Christmas is just – its I look forward to it. You know, all now, year it's great. Do y'all watch any, like, a, a family movie tradition or y'all kind of change it up here and there? Like, do y'all watch certain movies? You know, when it comes to movies, we tend to watch something new. Usually it's something we might have gotten on a Blu-ray or DVD for Christmas. We'll watch – usually it's something brand new. Okay. Do you um do you ever watch the Darkwing It's a Wonderful Leaf episode? Yeah, what we do – um, I mean, we started the tradition last year. We make a list of all the Christmas specials we want to watch. Mm-hmm. And throughout the month, um, we'll watch them with our daughter. And, Dar- and, of course, It's a Wonderful Leaf is on that list. Okay. You know, lots of different things. And, of course, we talked about a lot of this stuff on the last Flash Quack. Anybody who missed that, we did mm-hmm. a Flash Quack earlier this month about our favorite Disney Christmas uh, specials and shorts and movies. So definitely check that out if you haven't listened to it yet. Now, do you have a favorite uh, Christmas memory from your childhood? Like, anything in particular? Anything in particular? You know what I, I always enjoyed doing uh, with my father, rest in peace? We used to decorate the outside of our house. Oh, okay. We had the most decorated house in the block, really. Like as much of the uh, 
you know, the old plastic light up ornaments that everybody used to have back in the eighties. We used to just have them all over the house. And I used to love going out there with them in the cold and setting everything up and lighting everything up every year. Mm -hmm. You know, we stopped that when he passed away, but um, it was a lot of fun when we did it. And that's, I think that's one of the best memories I have of Christmas, just getting to do stuff like that with him. Oh, okay. And, and of course, sneaking downstairs at like 4 a.m. on Christmas morning with my sister to see what we got. Mm -hmm. That was always fun. But how about you? Do you have anything? Uh, I know my wife. She takes the kids uh, to – there's this neighborhood around us. Um, I don't know the name of the neighborhood, but normally she takes them to this one neighborhood and, like, all the houses on, like, two blocks are just lit up. And, you know, people will park their cars at the entrance of that subdivision and walk those two blocks and look at each house. I, I think the neighborhood makes it into a competition. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure because I don't go with them every year. But, you know, it's something that they do. Uh, my wife also takes them to, you know, um, this mall here called Peachtree Mall. You know, there's always a Santa in the mall. And, you know, they get the, their photos taken with Santa every year. Um, you know, we let them open one gift Christmas Eve. Uh, my wife's a big eggnog person. So she always, we got the eggnog year round, you know, well, not year nice. round, but that month, you know, <laughs> my wife loves eggnog. Yeah. I, I normally do the basic, the turkey, the ham, and, you know, a little, some of the, some of the same Thanksgiving food, sweet potato souffle and stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I do cook some, uh, movies, you know, we switch it up. I, there's one particular movie I try to watch every year, and that's Bill Murray's uh, Scrooge. I love that that movie. Um, I do that's try a good to one. Yeah, it's a great one to me. I do try to stay away from uh, a Christmas story because TBS plays it for like what 24 hours on Christmas Day. I'm you just know, I, I'm I tired of that movie. To, I I actually I really enjoy that movie. We we never end up watching the entire thing in one shot. We'll watch like the beginning here and the middle there and the ending here. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, we'll have watched the whole thing within that 24 hours, but we never watch the whole thing in one sitting because mm -hmm. we're always too busy. But I do make a point to check it out. You're right. TBS runs it to death, but I love that movie. Yeah. And I guess from my childhood, the only the one memory I really enjoy about Christmas was when we were living in Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Ricans have this tradition. They call it the Three Kings Day. I guess most people refer to them as the Three Wise Men. And right. it's on it's on January 6th. So uh, in Puerto Rico, they got to keep their Christmas trees up through January 6th. And then on Three Wise Men Day or Three Kings Day, they will put um, grass in a shoebox. And it was for, supposed to be like for the camels to come eat the grass. And then the three wise men will leave you a gift. So you got oh. two like two Christmas days, you know. That's cool. I've heard of that, but I didn't know they did that. Yeah, they did that. And, you know, because we lived in Puerto Rico, my dad just went ahead and did it, too. So we got extra gifts. So for us, it was more Nintendo games. Yeah. Well, of course. <laughs> but yeah, Actually, that, that's... I think Go my ahead. favorite my favorite Christmas present ever was the year I got the Super Nintendo. Oh, yeah, that's got to be amazing. I think my best gift ever was when my dad got me my first BMX bike. Oh, my God. I went crazy over that thing. Awesome. Yeah, man, because I that was when I I was like I'm no longer walking to school. I'm riding my bike. I'm going to the where the skateboarders hang out and ride my bike up there. And that's when I first broke my arm. And the <laughs> first, <laughs> you know, so yeah, great memories, man. Great memories. Yeah, gotta love Christmas. All right, so Mike, what episode are we doing today? We are doing Can't Buy You Love. Now, does that title have anything to do with Can't Buy Me Love, the Patrick Dempsey movie? Um, <laughs> possibly. Yeah. Possibly. And I, by, by the way, I do love that movie, and I know they did a remake with Nick Cannon. Uh, Love Don't Cost a Thing. Oh yeah. Movie. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, I think it's a solid movie. Not a great movie, but a solid '80s teeny bopper movie. That's awesome. Yeah, and uh, Geraldo was in it. Ah, oh, Rico was Suave. He? <laughs> <laughs> he was in that movie. <laughs> Small role, but he's in it. You can see him from time to time. Okay, so here we are. We're Can't Buy You Love. We're getting a new villain this week. Yeah, new villain. I, I like the sidekick villain on this episode, Mike. Yeah, me too. Um, so yeah, the original air date for this one was Thursday, September 26, 1991, and it was only ninth in production order. Ooh, is this our earliest one? No, we've done earlier. Okay, okay. So production order, this one's way up there. Not even double digit. Nope, not no, not even. 
Um, it was the first one animated in Japan out of all the ones we've talked about. Mm -hmm. Um, and it also has, it has a lot of original music in it too. So you can always, you can always tell when they're early episodes, when they have a lot of original music Mm -hmm. and this one kind of has to have it because there's so much like Cajun music in it. Uh Like whenever Jambalaya Jake shows up, like you could tell it's him. It's the soundtrack starts playing Cajun songs. Um, and obviously you can't use that for just any other episode. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. Gotta, it's gotta be on this one. So yeah, early episode. Our story editor is Bruce Talkington again, mm-hmm. and it's written by we have a new writer here, uh, Dean Steffen. Um, he got his start in the late '80s, worked on most Disney shows, other shows like X Men, Cat Dog, uh, the newer Masters of the Universe series, Dragon Tales, just uh, a whole bunch of stuff, and still active as of this year. Okay. Um, yeah, so new writer Dean Steffen. And it was animated in um, over at Disney Japan. That's your favorite one so far, right? Um, yeah, I'm partial. No, you're to Australia, Austra- right? Yeah, I'm yeah. partial to Australia, but I like Disney Japan as well. Um, I think this one being animated in Japan is a big part of why I do like it. Mm-hmm. It's um visually very very fun. I think the characters are on models. There's a lot of fun animation in it. The backgrounds look great. Um, I think if it had not been animated in Japan, I don't think I would like it very much. In fact, the second and final Jambalaya Jake episode was has much weaker animation, and it's probably why I don't like that one very much. This one I love, and okay. I think the animation has a lot to do with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a couple of standout scenes. I'll mention those when we get there. And um, So let's jump right into the plot. Okay, well, the plot starts off with a... They never say her name. It's a woman, uh, and she's speaking about the Bayou Founda- uh, Foundation, and she's yes. talking about the donations they receive. They, do they yeah. ever say her name? I, I didn't catch it. No, but this character model comes back in Comic Chameleon, mm-hmm. and in that episode, her name is Mrs. Howell. So okay. I don't I don't think this is the same character, because you know how they always reuse... Uh, you know, character designs, but it's possible. Mm-hmm. And, um, oh, by the way, she's also voiced by Jodie Carlisle, who voices um, Sarah Bellum. Okay. So you're just throwing that out there. So, yeah, it's a Save the Rainforest fun, uh, fundraiser. Not mm-hmm. Rainforest, I'm sorry. Save the Bayou fundraiser. Yeah. <laughs> My bad. Yeah, and, you know, as she's giving the speech about the donations they receive, Gumbo jumps in the projector screen. <laughs> yes, it's Gumbo, and Gumbo is voiced by Jim. He doesn't really talk much, though. Does he just make oh, noises here and there? He makes noises here and there. He says yum a few times. <laughs> and he jumps in the screen, and Jambalaya oh, Jake shows up. Jambalaya Jake. Everyone's so, so divided over Jambalaya Jake. Most people I know consider him very stereotyped and yeah i guess you know um i don't hate him how do you feel about him um i'm not a fan of him i love gumbo gumbo to me oh yeah gumbo's amazing he's great uh i don't want to get too much in the detail about jambalaya i want to save it for the end when we do our gas gun you know canisters that's, that's fair okay you know but uh and it's not all him that i don't like uh, I do like the jokes that come with him, you know, as far as his height and stuff like that, you know. Um, but, yeah, okay. Well, basically, Jumbo jumps in the projector screen, and then Jambalaya shows up, and he steals the money from the donations. Right. And right away, you get an interesting contrast between Jambalaya Jake and Gumbo. Mm-hmm. Like, Jambalaya Jake is, like, very low class. Like, <laughs> he, he jumps on the, the banquet table. He just shoves his face into the soup. Meanwhile, we got Gumbo over here. He can't eat something as small as a cocktail weenie without putting a napkin around his neck and eating it with a knife and fork. And he does it several times, man. <laughs> yeah, that's like, that's, like, that's like Gumbo's shtick. He's this big alligator who's so dainty and refined. And now, I, think that's, I think that's such a great characterization. I mean, there have been so many alligators in Disney cartoons and movies, and I'm so glad they did something different. And not just made him like TikTok Croc again. Okay. I mean, he's his own character, and I think it works really well. And now, we'll Mike, talk more about him later. Now, Mike, not to put you on blast, and I know you said you never really had Cajun food before. Have you have you ever had gumbo? No. Oh man. Oh, you are missing never out. Never in my life. One day I will, I'm sure. 
Okay. Do, do you know what a gumbo is? Uh, kind of, but for the folks at home and possibly myself who doesn't know, can you mm-hmm. explain it? Uh, the best way I can explain it is kind of like a stew, but it's not really a stew. Uh, yeah. But it has rice in it. It has like uh, cut sausages, shrimp. You can do all kind of stuff. And then, of course, it has the Cajun spices in it. It's so good, man. I freaking love it, dude. I'm going to have to try it sometime. Yeah, it's it's, it's really good. Uh, have you ever had jambalaya? No. Okay, jambalaya is basically same thing kind of, but no stew at the time. It's just rice with a whole bunch of stuff cut, chopped up in it. You know, you can have green beans, sausage, shrimp, all that stuff. But, of course, the rice is just kind of cooked differently. It's just, you know, basically boiled. And then you add a little more spices to it. It just, it just doesn't have that stew feel to it, you know? Right, right. Yeah, that's all it is. That sounds good. Mm-hmm. One day. And we didn't even mention who voices Jambalaya Jake. Oh, yeah, we sure didn't. <laughs> so Jambalaya Jake is voiced by Michael Goff. Mm-hmm. And he's um he's had quite a career. Um his career goes back to the mid eighties and he's yet another one of those voice actors who was in everything. <laughs> like his IMDB page was so nuts, I had to go over to Wikipedia just to narrow it down, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but more so than cartoons and television. He's all over the place with video games, and I feel like that's probably where he's most Mm well-known. You know, um, and I don't, I'm not, I like video games, but my knowledge of a lot of it just basically is the Mario stuff and stuff from the uh, 8 and 16-bit era before there was voice acting in video games. So I can't really go into detail about what his video game career actually was, except for the fact that he's done a lot of it. Okay. But as far as the television and Disney voiceover work, um, I think around this time, he was most well-known as far as, for Disney at least, for voicing Gopher from mm-hmm. the Winnie the Pooh show. Um, and you, you, know that, you know that voice, right? The whistling, the whistling oh, yeah. S's. Yeah, mm-hmm. he did Gopher after, um, he wasn't the original voice of Gopher, that was Howard Morris. But um, he was Gopher in the 80s and 90s, and they've dropped that character now. They don't use him anymore, because he wasn't an original character from the book, so I don't use him anymore. But he was Gopher, and right before Darkwing Duck, he was Colonel Spigot from Tailspin. Oh, oh okay. I remember Colonel yeah. Spigot. Yeah, so so he's Jambalaya Jake, and he's he's given this role as all, basically. He's he he's he makes it work. Like mm-hmm. he's fun enough to listen to. I'm personally kind of shocked that Jim didn't do this character. Yeah, because Jim is for he lived in New Orleans for for a while, man. I'm a, yeah, I um for about a decade he lived in New Orleans, mm-hmm. and recently, of course, in The Princess and the Frog, he voiced Ray, the Cajun Firefly. Oh yeah, a voice <laughs> I ab- a voice I absolutely love. He's mm-hmm. so great in that movie. They, they, they let him sing like two entire songs in that film, and um, <laughs> he was also the voice of Leatherhead, the Cajun alligator from the original Ninja, Ninja Turtles cartoon. I remember that. Yeah, so he has a history of doing that kind of voice. But at the same time, I guess there's like so few characters in this episode for Jim to voice three of them probably was a bit much. Yeah. You know, and like after um, uh, Jody Carlisle's character disappears in a second or two, it's only Darkwing Launchpad, Gumbo and Jambalaya Jake for the entire show. Mm-hmm. Like, literally. And if three of them were voiced by Jim, it might have been a little uneven there. So I'm OK. <laughs> I wonder what it would have been like if it was Jim. But I guess okay. we'll never know. But I like it. Michael Go is fine. Goff okay. is fine. Sorry. And um, so yeah, go, moving on. Yeah, wait, just, let's get back. <laughs> let's get back. Yeah. But um. Yeah, DW shows up oh, quick. I am the terror flapping the night shows up early. Yeah, very early. And there's no unique entrance line. He tries to get through. I am the scourge that pecks at your nightmares, but he can't get through it because Launchpad's doing um. Shadow puppets in the in the uh, the spotlight. Oh yeah, and it's hilarious. <laughs> and um, the animation in this opening sequence is pretty funny. Lots of funny expressions, especially when Darkwing notices what Launchpad's doing, mm-hmm. and it gets and gets thrown off. And um, but Darkwing captures um, he he gets uh, Jambalaya right away and grabs the money back. Yeah. Yeah. So he's got the he's got the money, and then. Gumbo and Jambalaya run off, and they slide down the elevator shaft. 
Yeah, and then then they show up at they weren't at his hideout though. What it was like they were at a like a bay. You can see the bridge where the boats will park and all that kind of stuff. Well, no, um, Jambalaya and Gumbo live in the sewers. Yeah. And but they, they weren't in the little... sewer for the next scene, were they? Yeah, it's in the sewers, but he's got like a little sewer shanty down there. Oh, a little, a little okay. shack he's built down there. <laughs> and um, I like this scene. Um, the animation's great as Jambalaya is walking around, uh, screaming and ranting about how Darkwing stopped him, and swinging the fish up in the air. Yeah. And while he's uh, getting all, you know, while he's all running around you got gumbo behind him trying to clean up the mess after him he's wearing a bib he's got a dustpan and a broom mm-hmm. it's the contrast between the characters is really fun and um so Was yeah he eating so, raw fish on yeah that he, just, he eats the raw he eats the fish oh, raw, that's so gross right, <laughs> right down to the bone and uh yeah so he says um he better jump back and stay on his side of the swamp because mm-hmm. the next time he messed with jambalaya jake will be his last i guarantee yeah. Yeah. And then and then we get DW. He's like telescoping the city, and uh, he thinks Big the telescope. city's on fire. Yeah, it's great. He he sees smoke in the telescope, and he flips out, starts screaming, and he goes, "Call my insurance company!" It's <laughs> it's great, and it's not a it's nothing's on fire. It's just launch pad. He made brownies. <laughs> he's made some brownies, and uh, he got them from the Gulp and Gourmet. But he says he improvised. So, um, you know what I like about this episode, one of the many things I like about it is that this is one of those episodes where Darkwing's like just a pure cartoon character. So many crazy things happen to him in this one. Like mm-hmm. he gets he gets pounded like a lot. And he eats he eats the um the brownie. He smiles for just a second and then his mouth erupts in flame. <laughs> like like flame just flies out of his mouth and uh he puts it out by drinking the entire water cooler yeah this is like the third or fourth time we see he can't handle spices man well in this episode my assumption is just launch pad's a bad cook <laughs> because even jambalaya thinks it smells awful yeah he does when he sniffs the brownie so i think you're supposed to assume that the brownies are terrible it's not darkwing's fault Okay. Um, but I do, I do like he drinks the entire water cooler, and he tells Launchpad he's on a liquid diet, and he has this big swollen rear end. Oh yeah. <laughs> that bounces across the ground as he walks. And you can hear the liquid <laughs> just bouncing in him. <laughs> it's great. So then Jambalaya and uh, Gumbo are at the bank trying to rip open the the door of the safe. Mm-hmm. And there's a funny drawing of Jake when the safe door smashes him against the wall. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> he's like a pancake. And um, so they start collecting the money, and then there's he no entrance. shows up. He had no entrance. He just, the cloud of smoke shows up, and he's just standing there, you know, just all casual. Because mm-hmm. he has no respect for Jambalaya Jake. He even he even insults his height. Yeah. But um, they try to escape. Launchpad saves the cash, thankfully. And mm-hmm. so getting stuck in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, LP saving the money, even though he was not trying to just save the cash, he was actually trying to capture, but it's it's good to see LP be very usive, you know? Yeah, and that has a lot to do with this being like an earlier show, and they're not sticking Goslin into everything yet. Mm-hmm. So because she's not in it, it allows Launchpad to actively, actively be a secondary character alongside with Darkwing. Yeah. And that's important for this episode because he becomes a central figure a little bit later on in the episode. But, you know, it's nice, like, in a couple of episodes from now, we get Fungus Among Us, which is more of this kind of thing, mm-hmm. where Launchpad's important, like, really playing the sidekick role. And um, so they shut the lights off, and... Um, <laughs> Darkwing uh, hurts Dark- himself. Darkwing <laughs> stubs his toe on the chair. Mm-hmm. And... Um, this is my probably has my favorite animation in the whole episode because there's this one Disney Japan animator. Now, we've already seen this guy's work. He did the lullaby from Darkly Dawn's A Duck Part 2, and he did the Tron Splitter fight in Negaduck. So he does this scene. And this guy's quirk was having characters point their fingers up in the air and wiggle their finger as they're talking. Mm-hmm. And if you really pay attention to it, you're going to see it like in everything this animator did for every Disney show. And I just have to point it out because it's so distinctive. 
But anyway, Darkwing grabs his uh his um lighter mm-hmm. and he turns it on, he starts the um what do you call it the sprinkler system goes off. Yeah, the fire sprinklers. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, look at the feet on Darkwing's face is so funny. Yeah. And uh, he floods the bank and the villains escape again. Luckily they saved the cash at least. Mm-hmm. And then we end up back with Jake. Yamalaya Jake. He's getting a yeah. massage. He's getting a massage by Gumbo. I love it. And <laughs> so, so Jake is tired of being defeated by Darkwing over and over again. So now he has a plan to catch, you know, to get, catch Darkwing in his own game by, you know, stalking and tracking and setting a trap. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah. So what happens next? Well, he he pretty much uh, they do another robbery. Right, but the robbery this time was not specifically to steal something, although they clearly have. No. It's to use the burglar alarms to get Darkwing the Launchpad's attention. Yeah. So, and which they do. They did, they did, they definitely got him uh, coming toward them. Cause what I liked about that scene, though, real quick, uh, Mike, was we get a lot of the rat catcher in this episode. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I love them. Yeah. Whenever they're on the rat catcher, I love it. Mm-hmm. And I love the little bit where um, Launchpad asks Darkwing if he'll try another brownie, and Darkwing says he'll try it when he's out of hand grenades, <laughs> which is oh, a joke yeah. that actually they they come back to later. Yeah, and, it's um, mentioned a few times. The hand grenades is mentioned a few times. Right, and um, so they Darkwing tries to see what's around the corner because Jumbo and Gumbo have escaped, but um, it's just a cat, and it jumps yeah. on launch jumps on Launchpad. He drops his brownie. And they leave. But and, uh, Jake, uh, Gumbo eats the brownie, doesn't he? No, no, wait. Before he, yeah, he eats does. it. Yeah, but before he eats it, Jake smells the scent of the brownie, doesn't he? Yeah, he doesn't even say it smells worse than possum innards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's disgusting. <laughs> and uh, so Gumbo actually, isn't this where he sets up a table and grabs a knife and fork? Yeah, this is eat it. the brownie. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and, and, um, Jake gets on his hands and knees and starts, you know, following the scent. Like a track dog. <laughs> and Gumbo just looks at the camera and shakes his head. He's like, mm, mm, mm. It's like, um, he's like, look at this guy. Look what I'm, look what I'm stuck with. Yeah. And then uh, Gumbo and uh, Jake, they show up at Drake's house while LP is uh, making brownies. And this is where we finally get the mention of Honker and Goslin, where they're at. Yeah, they actually explain why they're not there. They're at summer camp, right? Yep, they're at summer camp. Yeah, so um, he's making brownies for Goslin and Honker. I wonder if they would actually eat those if they were there. <laughs> <laughs> and Launchpad throws a few brownies under his flight cap, and then he gets ambushed by the bad guys. Yep, he's captured. Yep, captured, and uh, the bad guys make their entrance right through the wall. <laughs> And then uh, it cuts to Drake. Uh, basically, he's noticing LP is captured, but he says he see dinosaur prints. Well, he says, um, I love the line, either launch pads testing on a new pair of alligator shoes. <laughs> or he's in the clutches of that swamp shrimp. And then he hears launch pads scream. He goes so much for the alligator shoe theory. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the only time in the episode you see him as Drake. Yeah, the only time, and it's really quick. Yeah, he's wearing a robe. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he shows up as Dark Queen, and he's he's following them. He's tracked them. Yeah, not even on the rat catcher. He's, like, on foot. Mm-hmm. He's on foot, and he's trying to find them, because they're carrying a launch pad in a big sack. Yeah, he noticed they turned a corner, and he's like, I know that street. It's a dead end. Right, but they actually, like, crawl up the wall, and they're, like, hot, too high for him to see. Yeah, the old hiding on the ceiling or roof gag, you know, the way where right. your arms is touching one building and your legs are touching another wall or something, you know? Yeah, he's <laughs> confused because he says, he's, I saw them go in there. It's a dead end. And uh, so Darkwing leaves. And this is when they take Launchpad back to the zoo, correct? Yeah, this is the first time we see or or get a, the St. Canard Zoo. I think it might be the only time we see it. Is it? I thought we get it one more time. If you can think of the episode, let me know because I'm drawing a blank. Okay. Uh, but um, yeah, Jake says he uh he likes this place because he has a kinship with the reptiles because he's such a snake. Mm-hmm. And Launchpad <laughs> goes, no argument there. And um, <laughs> so he leaves. 
Gumbo to watch Launchpad. He ties up Launchpad, hooks him up to some explosive. Um, it's his it's his granny's uh, secret formula or something, right? Mm-hmm. He mentions his granny. We're gonna see his granny in the next Jambalaya Jake episode. Okay, I just looked on the Darkwing Wikipedia, and it says the Saint Canard Zoo was mentioned in Apes of Wrath. It was mentioned. Was, was it? Shown. Yeah. Oh, because I know they definitely don't go there in that episode. No, it says Gosling considers an encounter with gorillas in the wild even better than going to the zoo. That's what ah. she mentioned. Yeah. Okay, so this is the only time we actually see it, though. Yeah, this is the only time we see it. So, you know, so he's gonna use Launchpad's clothes to bait Darkwing. But yeah. how much clothing did he was Launchpad actually wearing? Man, they had that clothes <laughs> everywhere. Did you see the whole pile of that construction area, man? Like, Jesus, like, I know he ain't wearing that much clothes. <laughs> but on top of all of that, he's still wearing long johns. Yeah. When he's, when he's tied up. <laughs> so how much clothing was he wearing? <laughs> yeah, and of course, long johns and heart-shaped boxer shorts, mm-hmm. which is a cartoon cliche. Everybody wears heart-shaped boxer shorts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so Darkwing. This is when Darkwing starts getting. Like, this is when Darkwing starts taking the lumps. He's driving on the rat catcher, and a manhole cover hits him. Oh right, yeah. Right, right into the wall. Mm-hmm. And then Jake is throwing manhole covers at him. Darkwing's dodging them, and then the whole wall falls on him. Yeah. And then and then Jake comes by with two more manhole covers and smashes him in the head with them. Mm-hmm. So Darkwing just gets he gets beaten up, man, in this one. And he follows Launchpad's clothing to a construction site. Yeah. Because as, as Jake says, well, you're hunting for Launchpad, I'll be hunting you. Yeah. He he basically called him out. The challenge has begun. Yeah. Cause you know, the thing with Jumbalaya Jake, he isn't smart. And again, yeah, he's a stereotype, but he's tenacious and he's tough. Yeah. He he's he kind of reminds me of Darkwing a lot because he's cocky and he refers to himself in third person a lot. Right. And even Darkwing says, it was my line at the beginning here, he's developing a grudging respect for him. Mm-hmm. Because he's not, Jake is not a wimp. Not at all. He's not backing down. No, not at all. Like I said, he's super tenacious. And you know what? He isn't smart, but he is clever. Yeah. You know, because he gets to the... um. He gets to the construction site, and this is where he sees the penny on the floor, and he gets nailed with the wrecking ball. Yeah, and then he uh he got tricked into the he cement. He he Darkwing said it wasn't cement though. It wasn't. He his was, sixth sense told him it wasn't cement. Yeah. Yeah, and it ended up being quicksand. Yep. Again, I think he said it was his granny's formula, his special yeah. quicksand, and he <laughs> he uses his giant rocket attached to the gas gun to shoot him right out of the quicksand. He falls right through a building. Yeah, he says, I like, hope that roof will break my fall. But <laughs> but he crashes through the roof, crashes through every single floor, falls down the stairs. Yeah. And he says, I, I wish the floor, the roof was, wait, I wish the fall was all that was broken. <laughs> yeah, but Jambalaya is still coming at him after all that. He he shoots that boomerang rope, man. Yeah, boomerang. The early 90s, the height of Australian... Uh, pop culture awareness he's using a boomerang over here yeah and you know he he ties darkwing up you know builds a box around him and then fills it with real cement this time fast drying too but before he filled it up darkwing got so cocky it was like i can escape this (laughs) and this box has no cover on it (laughs) and he's like the rope is not tied all the way and (laughs) Yeah, and uh, see, Jake is clever. He goes, he's got no roof because I can pour the cement in. Mm-hmm. And, and he, uh, he, he leaves. Yeah, he leaves. Uh, he leaves the area as always. The bad guys leaves before the death of the the hero, and uh, DW escapes. He get, he has a hand grenade with him. Yup. And he and he and he blows himself up for the first time in the episode. Not not the only time. <laughs> and he does the um the singed but triumphant line again. Yeah. And then uh Jake uh Jambalaya Jake he ends up where Launchpad and uh Gumbo are. Mhm. Back at the zoo. Mm-hmm. And, and uh is this where we get a scene from the credits, right? Right. We are running out of those. We don't have much of that left. Okay. Um he's swinging from a vine from the tree. Yeah. That's from the credits. And he he kicks him. Right. He does. 
and then Jambalaya uh, fires a bow and arrow at him. But what saved Darkwing with the bow and arrow? Three. He shot three arrows. It was three, three arrows. Of them, yeah. yeah. Um, an eight by ten glossy. A whole stack of them in his, in his uh, <laughs> inside his shirt. Oh man, talk about DW cockiness and we conceitiness. <laughs> and we didn't mention, which is important, the explosives that are tied to launch pad are tied to a plunger, a dynamite plunger. Yeah, he called it a Bayou milkshake, didn't he? Yes, he does. Mm-hmm. And Darkwing gets, you know, Darkwing's furious because eight by ten glossies are expensive, and he throws them down right on the plunger. I don't know about you. I know it's just a tiniest little tid, tiniest little animation bit, but I love the way the photographs fall on the plunger and oh, then yeah. slowly slide off like paper would, mm-hmm. you know, in both directions. It's such a little touch, but it, you can feel the weight of the papers hitting the plunger when he does okay. that. Mm-hmm. And of course, the explosion goes off. Nobody dies, you know, <laughs> so so nobody was ever in danger. Yeah. And, and somehow they end up inside a turtle shell. Yeah, that part was hilarious. <laughs> a poor turtle. Cause, yeah, because both both of their heads pop out on both ends of the turtle shell. <laughs> right. Yeah. And um, so they're off to track Jambalaya in the sewer. And, and Darkwing knows he lives in the sewer because he says, what, are you kidding me? You ever get a whiff of that guy? <laughs> uh, oh, my God. Jambalaya Jake must stink. Yeah. And then uh, Darkwing knows they're in the right direction because he stepped on a what? A bear trap. Oh, oh yeah. Oh my God, that must have hurt. Uh, he says, um, he knows they're getting close, and Lawrence Patty asks how he knows. And he <laughs> says, I feel it in my foot. And he lifts his foot up, and the bear trap is stuck to it. He also asks for Launchpad's last brownie because okay. now he's out of hand grenades. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, <laughs> Launchpad steps on Gumbo's tail. Yes. Yeah, just as he's telling Darkwing to watch where he steps, he steps on Gumbo's tail. I know, right? <laughs> so Gumbo chases after Launchpad, and then we get this scene with Darkwing and Jake. Yeah, Jambalaya where... challenges him to a wrestling match. Okay, so this scene where they go, none of this, none of that, okay? That is directly from a Chuck Jones Daffy Duck cartoon. Maybe you've seen it. It's the one where Daffy and Elmer Fudd end up in a wrestling match. Ah. And Daffy keeps saying we have to go through, go by some rules. He goes, none of this, none of that. And he keeps pounding on Elmer. Mm-hmm. And at the end, Elmer is like, but wait a minute. You said none of this, none of that. And he starts pounding on Daffy. Like okay. that's, that's literally what they're referencing here. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, Jake's like, you know, none of this, none of that. Hitting him with an anvil, with a mallet. He even sticks a stick of dynamite in Darkwing's mouth. Yeah. Now, during this wrestling match, uh, Mike, we get another credit scene, don't we? Oh, not credit, but the, the opening scene. Do the opening we? credit? Yeah, when uh, Darkwing is kicking Jambalaya in the face several times. No, th- I've seen that somewhere else, but it's not in the main. It's not in the title s- sequence. It's is not. it the kicking in the groove? Yes, it was. Okay, that's where I saw that scene. I was like, man, I know that. That's is that in the opening credits or kicking in the groove? I couldn't. I wasn't 100 percent sure. Yeah, definitely kicking in the groove. Okay. So yeah, um, so Jake is just getting mad because Darkwing's making a fool out of him now because Darkwing doesn't. Um, Darkwing tries to freak him out with an MI on the terror, you know, entrance, and uh, he grabs a tomahawk and tries to go after Darkwing, and. Um, Jake says you can't make Jake do what he don't want to do, but Gumbo can because <laughs> oh, yeah. Darkwing that that brownie finally comes back into play. He puts the brownie into his overalls and gets yeah. uh, Gumbo to come after him. Yeah, Gumbo's chasing him, and uh, they fall down the whirlpool, man. Right, and they get flushed away. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, at the end, um, I, I like the end, the last line between Launchpad and Darkwing. Launchpad, uh. Launchpad, wait, Darkwing says the world can never be safe from anybody who fights Darkwing Duck to a standstill and survives your brownies. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's it's a fun episode. I really think, for me, the animation has a lot to do with it. And Darkwing, and it's just, it's cartoony. Darkwing takes a lot of lumps in this one, too. Mm-hmm. And I just, I enjoy it. It's like... A, it's slightly manic. It has a good energy to it as well. It does it never drags. Mm-hmm. It never drags, and it's just it's just it's a fun one. I do enjoy it. Okay. 
Um, I, I, I have mixed feelings. I'm more on the plus side on this one. Um, I, I love the jokes, man. The jokes are hilarious on this one. I love the gags of him getting blown up. Uh, you know, his mouth uh, exploding when he eats the brownie and he drinks all the water. The animation, I love the part when he drinks the water jug and you can see the shadow of his handprint on the other side of the water. I love that detail of it. You know, yeah, that's, that's Japan for you. Yeah, man, it was so detailed. I love the quicksand. I love the cement scene when he blows himself up. The animation was amazing on this one. You know, like even when it opens up and he's inside the 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 speech where she's talking about the foundation and they're inside that dining room area. Right. You know, the, the candles are lit. The tables are all completely set up. The animation is amazing on this one. Um, J- Japan does a really good job. They really do. Yeah, on this episode, I'm gonna go ahead and rate it right now since I'm really talking about it. Go I'm for gonna, it. I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it a three. I'm gonna give it three gas gun canisters on this one. How about you? That's where I'm gonna give it to. Okay, you're gonna give it three. Yeah, three gas gun canisters. Again, much like you, the animation has a lot to do with it. If this had been a Sun Wu episode, I probably would give it a two. Yeah. But I, but I think the visuals help the gags. Like and straight got, out, you said like the word get like the, you keep calling them gag. That's what I, that's what I, that's how I should be referenced. The gags work because the animation is so cartoony. Mm-hmm. And just like a Nega Duck has all these cartoony gags that Japan just nails. That's why this one works, and that's why the sequel Jake episode doesn't work. Yeah, you know. And I- and Gumbo really works, man. I like Gumbo. He is just hilarious as a sidekick, man. He really is. Gumbo works really well. I think they were very smart to give him that character quirk mm-hmm. where he's all proper, he's all dainty and delicate when he eats, and he seems almost ashamed he has to put up with Jake. Mm-hmm. But as the pet, as the you know inarticulate creature, he has no choice. Yeah. But... But I, I love – I do like their relationship that Jake is more of an animal than Gumbo is. Yeah. Now, what brings the episode down for me – and this is where I'll also kind of squeeze in my rating for the villain, our gas, you know, gas gun canisters here. What right. brings the episode down for me, Mike, is I kind of wish they would have wrote it to where Drake and uh, – well, not Drake, Darkwing and Launchpad would have made a trip to the Bayou area where I think his character would have fit more instead of being in the sewer. I didn't really like that. I kind of wish, you know, that like they had to go down to the swamp, you know, Honker and Goslin, they're on, they're at summer camp and they would have took a vacation down there and like, Hey, let's go Cajun, you know, go, let's hit up the swamps. Let's go eat some Cajun food. Let's go hit up Mardi Gras type thing. You know, we're on vacation. It's the summer, you know, that would have been a very, fun change of pace visually for this show Mm -hmm. but they don't the show doesn't do the travel episodes the way ducktales did yeah like that would have been a bigger component of double o duck you know going Mm -hmm. off the productions pre-production like the layout like those early production sketches by mike peraza they were going to travel a lot more Mm-hmm. And, you know, once they retooled the show, that aspect, like we saw it on Water Way to Go when they went to Oil Arabia. Yeah. And on Apes of Wrath when they went to the jungle. But we don't we don't get a lot of that. Yeah. And I feel like I feel like this ep- I feel like Jambalaya Jake, they could have done that. Yeah. It would have been a lot more interesting if they fought him on his own stomping grounds. Yeah, that's what I felt like this episode was missing. So, like, that's why I kind of take it down a notch. But I feel the animation and the gags and gumbo is like what still makes it interesting. It's not a bad episode, not at all, you know? Right. And so with my rating for Jambalaya Jake, I give him, I'm give i going to give him a three. Even though I'm not a fan of him, I do like that he he doesn't back down. You know, um, I Me love too. the jokes that, you know, Darkwing references about his height. And Gumbo saves him to me, you know? So I, if, I give him a if three. It was just, if it was just him on his own, well... I don't <sighs> think I think it would have been a much weaker episode. I think bringing in Gumbo really helped. It really helps big time. I agree with you on that. Definitely, uh, Gumbo saves him to, to me overall. Um, he he gets a little annoying. He, his accent is so stereotype, even though it does work. Um, 
Yeah, you know, and, and you know the jokes with it, you know, the the Bayou milkshake and all that kind of stuff that works too. But overall, I'm not a fan of Jambalaya because he really doesn't bring nothing to really threaten Darkwing. You know, he just does. He's just not scared. He's just not gonna back down though. You know. Right. I mean, he's tough. He's no wimp. So he's definitely still. I still think he's a better villain than a character like Lilliput or Trench Rot. Oh the yeah. King. All those <laughs> other villains we didn't give very high scores to. Mm-hmm. He's still better than all of them because he's a challenge. Yeah. Like he 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 beats up Darkwing pretty good. Yeah. So you know, Dark, Darkwing takes his lumps. I'm so gonna give him three him? guess. I'm gonna give him three as well. Okay. And a three? lot of that is on the strength of Gumbo. Yeah, same here, man. Gumbo really, really helps him a lot. I, I would think maybe if he would fight on his turf, I would have gave him a little more. You know, but because they're in St. Canard and in the sewer, it kind of doesn't make too much sense to me. But it's not a bad episode at all. At all. They, they do go to the bayou at the beginning of the sequel episode, Double Dark Wings. But mm-hmm. Darkwing never goes there. Yeah. You know, that episode, I that one I'm not a fan of. And it's, <laughs> it's 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 a good example of why they probably did not use him more than twice. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, cause this is just, he's one of those villains. You, he, he's kind of like ammonia pine where he's just one big Cajun pun. Yeah. And that's pretty much all he is. And when you do one plot with him, you've pretty much done with him. Yeah. You okay. know, I see where you're going with that. I see the comparison. Yeah. Okay. But, um, yeah. yeah, so that's can't buy you love. I like it. You yeah, know, it's, 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 it's it's not a bad episode. I hope I didn't come off like saying that this is a bad episode. Uh, I do like the episode. It really is Gumbo, though, man. <laughs> Gumbo makes me watch this episode, you know? Yeah, I can't get enough of Gumbo. Yeah, I, I can't get enough of him either. Um, and I, the animation, the animation is great on this one. Yeah, it really is. Um, no Japan for a while after this. Um, uh-huh. I think the next one for them... Is probably Toys R Us with Quacker Jack. All right. Um, but we got we got a ways before we get. They only did a handful of episodes. Their top tier studios only did what was it like seven episodes, and we've already done three of them. Okay. So we don't have a lot of Disney Japan, at least the top tier studios. Um, but yeah, next time we're coming back to Sun Wu. For uh, Bearskin Thug. Okay. Which, it, um, all I'll say right now is don't buy into the hate for that one. Cause some no, people I like have, it. But some people have. This This episode often gets trashed from people really? who are like, yes. I think it's a great Goslin episode. I will explain why next week. Yeah, and I, I like that the, the Muddlefoots are in it too, so. Yeah, and Steelbeak. And Steelbeak. <laughs> minor, you know, it's minor appearance, but it's still still be. But yeah. yeah, we'll um we'll unroll our sleeping bag, get our marshmallows out next time for that episode. Mm-hmm. And okay. yeah, um, so yeah, that that's it. That's this episode. All right. So Mike, uh, where can they uh, listen to our podcast at? Um, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, Apple devices. We're on YouTube, Pocket Cast. And one more, you always radio forget public. This one. Yeah, you got it. Yes, got them all <laughs> finally. Yes. All right, all right. you um, guys can uh, follow us on Facebook. We are on the Saint Canard Files, the Dark Wind Up podcast page. We also have an Instagram. The Instagram is still growing, Mike. Still doing pretty good, man. Yeah. Uh, we just got to be more active on there. Uh, I posted some photos on there recently, and people are acting to it. They like the photos. Um, of course, at the time of this recording, it's Halloween time, so I posted some Halloween stuff there. Uh, but this is a Christmas episode, you know, when it airs. <laughs> yeah, man. So, uh, Mike, man, uh, yeah. you got anything Cat, else you want to say? Cats out of the bag, Will. It's not two days before Christmas at the time of this recording. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't really have anything else to air, um, add about this one, this uh yeah, except that if you're listening to us on a podcast app where you can rate and review, please do that. Um, and just be active on our, our Facebook page, too. Uh, like things, comment on things, post in the visitor section. Mm-hmm. Um, I know we've got a few bigger names on the group now. Uh, I know Jim Cummings is there. Aaron Woo-hoo. Sparrow is there. 
Um, so Katie yeah, Lee. Katie Lee, Katie Lee is there too. Um, I know one of the writers from the, some of the episodes, Jim Peterson, is following us too. And um, yeah, so we're growing. All right. Uh, my shout out for this episode is going to be to Megan Edwards. Megan, she's been coming on hard on your character of the week last couple of weeks, man. She's I've, responding and being very active on there, man. I've noticed. So, uh, Megan, I hope you enjoyed uh, the character of the week this week on Jambalaya Jick and Gumbo. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that's it. I think we are. I think we're out of here for today. Yeah, we're out of here. So you guys make sure to stay dangerous and have a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. All right. Good night, y'all. Good night. <laughs>